One was that um, uh, I was born in Berlin because uh, my father was uh, stationed there with the CIA in the 1950s, early 60s. And, uh, you know, I left when I was two years old, but uh, came back again as a reporter uh, in the late 1980s. So I was there actually both when the Berlin Wall went up and then uh, in 1989 when the when the wall came down. So um, there is a, as a as an adolescent, right, when the wall went up and then as an adult reporter when the wall came down. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Not even an adolescent, like a, a two year old. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. OK, two. Yes. Um, fascinating. And um, you were with the Post, is that right? With the Washington Post, yeah. Well, when I was in, in uh, Germany, I was uh, stringing for a couple publications, the Army Times, and then the, the, the Washington Post. So, uh, but it was it was uh, I'd only planned on on living in Germany for a few months, but it turned in, into five years after the wall came down. You know, when when I was there, which was at a, at a different time, um, it would have been 1985. Um, I thought I thought West Berlin was a fascinating place. I thought it would be a really exciting place to live. I have absolutely no language um, uh, uh, ability beyond a you know smattering of English. But I, you know, I just I thought it'd be really an interesting place to to live as a you know as a kind of a young guy and and uh, just seemed like a vibrant place. But it also seemed like if anything happened, um, it would kind of be all over for the people in East Berlin or West Berlin by the time the news made it out to the West. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's in, in, in the middle of East Germany. It was yeah. certainly like the tripwire. If there was going to be a, uh, um, you know, World War Three, Berlin was a very likely candidate for where it would all start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as I mentioned, I just, it was just fascinating to, uh, to, to, to go to spend that day in East Berlin. East Berlin. I think uh, in our in tonight's uh, session, you'll give people a sense of, of uh, perhaps what what that was like and all the efforts that the uh, U.S. government, especially the CIA, went to to try to penetrate and understand what was going on the other side of the wall and and in uh, the Soviet Union generally. Yeah. So, so fascinating. Um, we're just about ready to start. All right. Hey, I'm Lee Wright. This is History Camp. I am near Boston and with me in Virginia is? Hi, I'm Carrie Lund. I'm the director of the Pursuit of History, which is the nonprofit that brings History Camp online to you. Tonight we have with us author Steve Vogel. Steve is a veteran journalist who has written for the Washington Post uh, extensively about military affairs and he is reported from Post War for the Post from Cold War Germany and covered the fall of the Berlin Wall. He's the author of several books, including The Pentagon, A History, and tonight's subject, Betrayal in Berlin, the true story of the Cold War's most audacious espionage operation. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, we really appreciate it. And this is actually the last of our weekly Thursday night interviews for this year, let me say just a couple of things and then we'll jump in and, and head to Berlin. Um, we have a great schedule for next year, starting in January with Amity Slaves. That schedule is at the History Camp site. Uh, you can also find it at historycamp.org slash schedule uh, and uh, download and print that and uh, put it on your refrigerator and join us every Thursday night. The other thing I would encourage you to consider is joining the Pursuit of History. It's a nonprofit organization that supports our in-person history camp, uh, our Thursday evenings such as this, our uh, American Summer Road Trip that we did in August, and, and other things. You can read, read all about that and join at thepursuitofhistory.org. So thank you, Steve. So <clears throat> it seems to me like you've got kind of a story within a story with a story. So, so one of those is this, is this larger event that happens that you're going to tell us about. And, and then within that is the story of a man who betrays his country. And, and then the, the, the other story, also large and complex, is you getting access to all the information, the people, the research, and so forth to compile the book. So why don't we start with giving people broad outlines of, of, of the, the major kind of story that you cover here? Well, sure. I mean, this is set in, in Cold War Berlin, pre-Berlin Wall. It's, uh, it's important to to remember that the early years of the Cold War, 
the wall had not been been built at this point, but the uh, uh, Berlin was a divided city uh, just uh, at the end of World War II. The, the, the great powers had uh, more or less divided up Germany and Berlin, um, which was deep into the the eastern territory controlled by the Soviets. Was uh, was kept as a, an allied city uh, under occupation, and there were uh, there was the uh, America and British and and French zones in the west, and then there was the eastern zone controlled by the Soviets. And um, Berlin uh, at this time represented essentially uh, one of our few windows behind the Iron Curtain, because uh, you know under under Stalin uh, the Soviets had kept very close control of, of Eastern Europe. Um, the CIA, which was um, uh, just a, a new fledgling organization, was having very little success in finding out anything about what was going on with, uh, with the Soviets. And they, they had shocked uh, the West uh, in 1949 when they'd exploded an atomic bomb. They had managed to steal some of the Manhattan Project uh, secrets. And um, uh, we knew virtually nothing about what their intentions were. And another thing that's important to remember is this is all pre-spy satellites. There was no U-2 flying uh, to, to get photographs of what, what's going on in, uh, behind uh, Soviet lines. Uh, the CIA was having very little luck placing any kind of agents uh, behind the Iron Curtain. You know, and every operation they, they tried to stage ended up being rolled up and KGB, meanwhile, was uh, was having great success at uh, penetrating the West, um, along with some of their uh, Warsaw Pact uh, allies, including uh, East Germany. So Berlin was was um, was kind of a flashpoint uh, because it was a divided city, um, and the Soviets were putting pressure on the West, trying to to find a way to force them out. You'd had the um, the blockade of Berlin. Uh, which uh, the Allies were able to overcome with uh, with the airlift, um, and there was a sense uh, when, when Dwight Eisenhower became president in 1953. Um, you know, he felt like the United States was essentially flying blind. He he was used to having great intelligence during World War II, and he he becomes president and finds that um, we know very little about what our our potentially greatest adversary, the Soviet Union. Uh, was up to what the intentions of the Kremlin were, even really the um, uh, who might take over after Stalin dies in 1953. And the CIA uh, had had some, uh, rather not really the CIA, we should say more uh, Western intelligence had had some success in the late 40s um, getting access to uh, Soviet communications um, through an operation that was run by Army Intelligence known as Venona. But uh, Soviet uh, agents, including Kim Philby, had managed to uh, blow that secret. So we were we were cut off. The CIA in the early 50s began thinking uh, that we needed a new way to tap into Soviet communications. And, and Berlin became sort of um, the focal point for this, this type of operation because of its location and because you had the Red Army which had a force of 400,000 troops, uh, mostly in East Germany, but also in Poland, Czechoslovakia, um, more or less on a war footing, ready to, to move into the West. And um, the thought was with the Red Army headquarters in Berlin uh, being the target, that if they could uh, come up with some way to tap into Soviet lines in East Berlin, we could at last have a some kind of window into Soviet intentions, in, including what uh, the prime thing that uh, Eisenhower was worried about, which was the possibility of a nuclear Pearl Harbor. So he he was desperate for some kind of early warning about what uh, the Soviets might do, and you know out of this uh, grows this idea in conjunction with. Uh, CIA's partnership with uh, MI6, the, Brit the British Secret in Intelligence Service, of digging a tunnel to tap into East, East Berlin to tap into Soviet communication lines. And, you know, the British had done this on a s smaller scale in Vienna, which was also a, a divided city. Um, and then uh, that had been successful. And by, uh, by 1953, uh, the CIA and MI6 had, had agreed to work on a new um, program that would uh, dig a tunnel a quarter mile into 
um, Soviet held territory in East Berlin to reach communication lines that um, the West had been able to find uh, were essentially at a, at a place where they thought they could reach it with a tunnel. So that that's kind of the, the setup for for this book. That, that's fascinating. For anyone who isn't familiar with what the map of Germany looks like back then, you've got to go do a web search after our talk and and see this this kind of donut hole for land, right, in the middle of East Germany and this like, narrow uh, rail corridor that, that lead, lead, led to the West. Um, right. And it's just, it's just remarkable. Um, so it, once you see that geography, as so often is the case with history, you have a much better sense of, of why these events are occurring. Um, yeah, if you want me to show you a map, um, I have like one on my computer. I don't know if we have the technology to, to share let, that, but I could. Uh, let, let's see if we can do that. If we, if we can, Carrie will help us uh, make that happen. Um, but yeah, that's very important to the whole story. Just uh, realizing that Berlin is is essentially an island in the the middle of uh, East Germany, and uh, it was uh, a place where all four powers had had troops set up. But it was essentially undefendable for for the U.S. and its allies because you know the number of troops we had there was just uh, you know essentially a handful compared to the, the four hundred thousand Soviet troops that were stationed in, in Eastern Europe. So, so tell us a little bit about. You know, so, someone concocts this plan, uh, and this is this early days of the CIA and so forth. How does that get approved? Who says yes? Let's try it. Well, you know, it was, it was an idea that um, Bill Harvey, who was this remarkable figure, who was the station chief uh, in Berlin, um, or rather, rather the base chief, um, to use the uh, the proper terminology, because. Uh, the um, Berlin was not the the capital at, at that point. Um, he um, working with uh, uh, Frank Rollette, who was uh, one of the legends of World War II intelligence, uh, one of the guys who had um, really key figure in breaking the Japanese um, uh, codes that were that were being used for communications uh, uh, during the war. They uh, they more or less uh, are the guys who who started pushing this uh, as a as a, uh, a possible solution for uh, the gaps in U.S. intelligence, and uh, Harvey uh, brings the the project to uh, Alan Dulles, who was uh, newly appointed as uh, the CIA uh, director um, by Eisenhower and. Uh, Dulles, you know, had had a, a background in espionage going back uh, for a number of years. He'd been stationed in, in uh, Switzerland uh, with the OSS in, during World War II. And uh, he just loved this sort of cloak and dagger stuff. You know, the idea of tunneling into Soviet territory really appealed to him. And um, he uh, he gave it approval, brought it to, to Eisenhower. The British, meanwhile, Winston Churchill had come back, um, was had returned as prime minister. Of course, he and Eisenhower had worked closely together during World War II, and and Churchill likewise was was desperate for better intelligence, and uh, he he gave his approval on that end. So you had you had buy-in from the the highest levels of of both the United States and and Great Britain, and uh, they they gave the, the green light to the project. Interesting. Let me ask a question about uh, location, infrastructure, and so forth. <clears throat> Were they? tunneling in and wanting to tap into existing lines, lines that have been part of um, Berlin when it existed as a unified city, or were these new installations that the, uh, the Soviets and these Germans had put in? Yeah, these were actually the old imperial uh, telegraph lines that uh, you know went back to the days of the Kaiser, and Berlin had been really the communication hub of um, Eastern Europe. It was, it was like the hub of the wheel, so you had all the spokes coming in from, you know, Paris or uh, Vienna, uh, Budapest, they all, everything like met in, in Berlin. And, you know, from there, uh, communications continued back to, to Moscow. So uh, you had this um, very, um, uh, for, for the day, a very advanced infrastructure, communications infrastructure in, in Berlin. So that, that was another reason why it was such an appealing target. 
And the Soviets were essentially using um, these German lines that were controlled by the East German uh, Ministry of Telecommunications. And what the CIA was able to do was infiltrate the, uh, the East German Ministry by recruiting agents people who worked at the ministry or had relatives who worked at the ministry who didn't really like the Soviets, were, were not happy to be occupied and were, were quite willing to, to pass on intelligence. And they were able to uh, give the CIA information about where these lines ran, um, exactly who was using them, uh, which ones were connected to the Red Army headquarters in, in Wunsdorf, um, uh, just south of Berlin. Uh, so, uh, over the course of a number of months, really over a year, the CIA uh, developed so much uh, very accurate, um, actionable intelligence about exactly where these lines were. And so when they decided to dig the tunnel, they knew exactly uh, where to aim. They, they picked a site where the, the these lines were only were uh, a quarter mile away, basically, uh, which is one of the closer points they came to the sector border. Fascinating. So then tell us about the this engineering feat. And we're going to get to a little bit uh, this very startling uh, incident that happens that disrupts this uh, or has the potential to disrupt it. Tell us about the, the engineering of actually do, digging this this tunnel a quarter mile into, uh, into East Berlin. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the CIA didn't have the, uh, the skills to dig a, a tunnel a quarter mile, and they, they were going to need the help of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I mean, these these were the uh, uh, the guys who who had experience at uh, building things, you know, including the Pentagon. Um, but uh, they also had um, you know tunnel expertise. Um, so uh, uh, a special team of uh, Corps of Engineers, uh, three officers plus some enlisted men, uh, guys that uh, I was I was lucky enough to interview some of the, the folks who were involved in this operation, um, they were um, picked and brought out to uh, Sandia in New Mexico uh, for this special project. They didn't know, you know, what the mission was. All they were told was, you got to dig a tunnel. It's going to have to be done in secret. And, you know, let's go practice. And, uh, you know, so they were digging out in, in, the, uh, in the desert terrain out there, um, sandy soil, which is actually kind of similar to what exists in uh, Berlin. And they, you know, they had this this team. They all had uh, secret clearances, and they they trained out there for months. And then, uh, when they were ready to go, they were they had to ship all their equipment to uh, to Berlin, and that was no easy feat itself. Because I, as we discussed, Berlin is inside of East Germany, so they're going to have to um, send all the equipment over by ship to West Germany, and then uh, the U.S. and the Western Allies were allowed. Uh, very guarded access into uh, East in, into Berlin via uh, a, a nightly military duty train that was uh, allowed to cross through the East German territory into Berlin, and um, you know so all this stuff was disguised. They had uh, over 200 tons of uh, equipment that they were going to need to to build the tunnel. A lot of that was the steel liner that would have to to line the the, the tunnel because you, uh, the, uh, you know, the soil was too soft. It would collapse if they didn't have some kind of liner. Um, and all this stuff had to be uh, brought into to, to Berlin. They su succeeded in doing that. And then um, they, they needed to, ha to have a, a location where the, this whole operation was going to be launched. You can't just sort of dig a tunnel um, right out in the open. <laughs> so they, they came up with this idea to, to construct an army warehouse in the very southern part of Berlin. Um, and the idea was the warehouse uh, would disguise, would, would hide all the, the tunnel operation. They could also use the, the warehouse to store all the fill, you know, all the, the dirt, a quarter mile tunnels is a, is a lot of soil. And, uh, you know, if they started trucking that away from the site, you know, the East German guards, the Soviets who were nearby uh, would have seen all that. So they, they stored it in, in the warehouse. Fascinating. So <clears throat> did that go um, relatively smoothly? And at what point does, does this figure George Blake enter into our story? Right. Well, the, um, the digging, uh, <laughs> they had barely started um, 
and you know again they couldn't they couldn't like work walk around the site and do uh core samples and and you know get a, a sense of what they they had out there so they were going on the basis of some aerial photos and old geologic maps and uh, to their surprise they had barely um you know dug out of the basement of the warehouse and were down about eight feet when they they struck water um which they weren't expecting yeah. And uh, it turned out to be a perched water table that was held up by a layer of clay. And this this was a huge disaster because um, if you had water, it was going to make the whole digging of the tunnel much more difficult. But plus, it, it could interfere with um, the s sensitive electronic equipment that was going to have to be installed to um, to run a tap on the, on, uh, on the Soviet lines. So they had to dig uh, the tunnel at a much higher altitude than they thought. In other words, they were only, uh, you know, about eight feet below the surface, uh, which they were very fearful that the, you know, Soviets and East Germans could hear the, uh, you know, the digging. So this all had to be done by hand. They don't have, um, they're, they're digging the tunnel, you know, six men crews of the, the core engineers with, um, with their entrenching tools, you know, just the little shovels that you use to, to dig a foxhole. Um, and uh, they, they built like a, a miniature little railroad down in the bottom of the tunnel so that they could um, have this railroad, which was pulled by a, um, uh, these rail cars pulled by a, a little electric forklift, take the, the soil back to the, the opening of the tunnel and up into the warehouse. Um, so that, that was a problem. But um, once they, they, you know, once they decided to dig a little bit higher, they, they were able to, to um, mostly um, proceed without too much event there were some some real scares here and there though when um, um, you know people were overhead on top of the tunnel and the, the biggest scare came when the cold weather set in this is uh, in uh, in the fall of 1954 when they're digging and the first uh, little snowfall in October comes in Berlin and it turns out uh, the snow when it's falling doesn't stick to the uh, the ground right above where the tunnel is being constructed because there's heat coming down from below. And, uh, you know, they, they did have some air conditioning running down there, but they didn't have enough. So that was a big, you know, everybody ran around with like, you know, chickens uh, with their heads cut off in the, in the words of one of the, the guys who was there. Um, but uh, they managed to, uh, you know, pipe in more air conditioning. And uh, uh, fortunately that wasn't discovered. So uh, the, the digging goes on for um, eight months. Now, meanwhile, because this is a, a joint operation with the CIA and uh, British intelligence, um, there was really only a, a bare handful of, of people in either the CIA or MI6 who knew about this project because it was so uh, it was such a close hold operation. And one of them was uh, a gentleman named George Blake, who uh, you know was quite a figure. I mean, he's a, ma a major part, a uh, major character in, the, in this book, but he um, he was actually um, someone who had been uh, born in Holland. His father uh, was originally from uh, Turkey, he fought for the, the British army in World War I, become a, a British citizen, married a Dutch woman, and, you know, young George Blake was um, uh, actually in Holland when the Nazis invaded, and he ends up becoming a um, a courier for the Dutch resistance during World War II. And eventually he has to escape through Europe uh, because he's half Jewish and, uh, you know, he fears arrest. And he he uh, makes it to England and um, British intelligence is, is impressed with this guy and um, recruits him into British, uh, into into the MI6. And, you know, then he's the, the, the uh, he's sent to, to South Korea right before the Korean War breaks out. And, um, you know, he's taken prisoner and at some point while he's uh, held in captivity there for three years under very rough conditions, he decides to, to turn. Um, he decides he wants to, he wants to join the, uh, the communist side and he offers his services to the, to the KGB. And then he, along with the other British prisoners, when they're released, he's, you know, they get a hero's welcome and, uh, Un, unbeknownst to, to anybody at SIS at the uh, British intelligence, he's now working for the KGB. And ironically, he's one of just a handful of people who's in the know about this tunnel that's being dug. So let me let me stop there for just a second. I I think people are always surprised to hear when someone decides to 
betray their country, especially in this fashion. What happened in North Korea that caused him to say, you know, you look around, you say, gosh, this is a, a desolate, barren place with a bankrupt economy. Yes, this is this is what I want to be a part of. How did you decide he, he was going to uh, turn on his country? Well, you know, a part of it uh, stems from the year he spent in South Korea before the war broke out. And um, there was just rampant corruption in South Korea. The, the government uh, there was being uh, subsidized by the um, the U.S. You know, all this money was being was pouring into South Korea, and and um, a lot of it was being um, uh, you know given to the politicians and uh, various other corrupt enterprises. So Blake uh, became pretty disillusioned about that. Um, his own background. Um, he had spent a few years in Egypt as a uh, as a child because of, he had uh, uh, his family had relatives there. After his father died, he was sent there uh, for his schooling for a few years, and he was he kind of had exposure to the the haves and the have nots in in um, in and around Cairo. So um, then, once he's he's taken prisoner, um, they are. Uh, just given horrendous treatment by the North Koreans. Um, there's a death march that Blake and a number of American GIs that he was being held with were uh, uh, had to endure, and you know hundreds of, of these GIs died. Um, but uh, the way Blake describes it, as they're being held in this camp up near the Yalu River, um, and they're being bombed uh, pretty much uh, night and day by both the, the British and um, U.S. Air Forces, he began to think that he was on the wrong side. That he was he was seeing these villagers who were being wiped out by the, uh, the American bombing. So, if you want to believe that or not, that that's his story. Um, and the um, it's really the the one that um, uh, you know British intelligence uh, themselves, once his treachery is discovered, um, believes that he's actually an ide ideological spy. Um, rather than one who was motivated by money or, or other things. So, and, and was there any exchange of money at any point? No, no, um, no, that, that's never, uh, uh, certainly not when he was in, in Korea. I mean, the, the, there's some speculation that, um, you know, he did it to save his, his hide basically to, uh, you know, avoid being executed. Um, but the, uh, the record from, other prisoners who were um, held with Blake doesn't really support that, and we can't we can't rule it out. But uh, it it doesn't seem like um, there was really a uh, it doesn't seem like a situation where they had him up um, and you know had him up uh, ready to to shoot him against a wall and said unless you come spy for us. I mean he uh, his stories he volunteered his services. It's also possible that the KGB, which had access to these prisoners simply identified him as somebody they could recruit that, that's certainly a good possibility they you know they uh they realized that uh, you know maybe his um his his love of great britain since he had never really even hardly lived there at that point uh wasn't that strong to begin with and um yeah, he was, he was, he was with the cia is that correct or with mi6 he was with mi6 and his cover, I assume, was one of these kind of vague diplomatic uh, posts. Yeah, he was. He was, you know, the the deputy uh, counselor uh, to the uh, uh, to the British uh, legation in in uh, Seoul. So he had diplomatic cover. So, um, but he was actually the, the chief of their station there. And so, talk to us about his involvement and the role he played, and some really interesting decisions that were made by the Soviets to maintain that cover. Well, the thing is, uh, since, you know, Blake knows about the tunnel from even before a single spadeful of, of dirt is, is dug and he, he's able to get word to his KGB handler in London, they meet on a double decker bus. Um, and he, you know, he passes on information about this tunnel and, uh, his KGB handler, um, Sergei Kondrashov, obviously gets this information back to Moscow. Um, but it, it's immediately clear to this small circle of um, uh, the leadership at the KGB that um, because this project is so closely held, Blake is only one of three or four or five um, people in the British intelligence who know about it. 
if um, if they do anything to stop this tunnel, they're going to blow Blake's cover. And Blake was um, pretty quickly was uh, showing himself to be a, a, a exceptionally um, valuable spy. Kim Philby's use to the Soviets had pretty much come to an end by then because um, he'd come under suspicion and he wasn't really able to to do more um, espionage uh, for them. So uh, the, the KGB had high hopes for, for Blake, but they couldn't blow him out of the water, you know, right away. So they, they decided to sit on this information. The other thing is that, you know, the KGB is figuring, well, th these are the Red Army communication lines they're after. You know, who cares? It's the Army. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, the same sort of rivalries that, that go on in, in the West, too. Um, or even within um, uh, different branches of the intelligence between, say, the CIA and the FBI and the NSA, yeah. you know, you had the same thing going on in the Soviet Union, where um, the KGB wasn't really concerned about the fact that some of the GRU, the mil Soviet military intelligence, would be exposed by by this. So that's that's part of uh, that goes into the thinking of why they don't stop this tunnel. Yeah. Our, our secrets matter more than theirs, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's precisely the, the thinking. And and so, did they change any of the any of the communications at all? Was there ever anything done on the um, the East German or the Soviet side as a result of the knowledge of this tunnel existing? You know, this this would later be, become sort of the common assumption because um, you know why would they not have have changed uh, the, the information? But the um, the problem is the the sheer volume of communication that was being intercepted. These these were three uh, large trunk lines that uh, had been tapped. So you're talking about thousands of conversations, um, both voice conversations as well as um, uh, telegraph communications, um, teletype uh, are being intercepted um, over the course of eleven months. Th this adds up to. 400,000 conversations. If you um, if you begin planting bad information in that communication stream, it's going to be exposed as bad by, you know, the 99% of the information that that's good. There's no way they, that they could doctor um, that information. They thought about it. They talked about it. Kondrashov um, um, discussed it, but they, they decided it was, it was too dangerous. Um, and, uh, you know, every later analysis by the, the CIA and MI6 um, has never been able to find any uh, any uh, proof of disinformation. So the, uh, the, the answer is it doesn't appear that there was any disinformation. Fascinating. So what happens to the tunnel and what happens to Blake? Well, the tunnel um, operates for 11 months. Um, and, you know, it's like uh, for the, the, the team of processors back in the, the warehouse, um, you know, when they once they strike pay, uh, pay dirt, they're like a bunch of uh, oil cat, uh, you know, Texas uh, wildcatters who are just being drowning in the oil that they've they've struck because uh, there's so much uh, information coming in, and they are flying tapes back to um, London and to Washington uh, to be processed. You know, basically on a daily basis, and you have hundreds of people who are working in London and. Um, in Washington. In Washington, they're down near the Lincoln Memorial in, in one of the old uh, World War II um, temporary buildings that uh, used to exist on the mall. And, uh, you know, they, they're going through this and actually pulling out a stream of, of, of you know, sort of n nothing that's, nothing that's um, you know, uh, the secrets like a Manhattan Project type secrets, but these are all information about the, um, the Soviet order of battle that we didn't know anything about just how they operated you know what the um some of the new weaponry that they were developing some new nuclear uh, capabilities that they had um and the most important thing that uh they're getting from the tunnel is is what they don't hear there, there's really no um nothing that shows any sort of um soviet move for a um, preemptive strike into the into the west which was eisenhower's big fear so, you know, Eisenhower is writing in his diary, um, you know, it's, it's really uh, pretty amazing to, to see, but he, he's worried about having to launch his own preemptive strike against the Soviets because he's, he's not going to know if they're going to attack him. And, 
and that's his big worry. So for a year, um, the tunnel gives Eisenhower the, you know, the, the peace of mind that, um, that we're safe. And ironically, right when the tunnel is exposed, uh, the U-2 begins flying around uh, a month later. So there's even after the tunnel is, is, um, is stopped, uh, the U.S. now is in a better position to, to get uh, valuable intelligence. Well, fascinating. So, so what did what brought the tunnel to to the end? Was it ever um, formally discovered? Oh yeah, um, it was. Um, you know, basically the the, uh, the, the KGB. And you're you're talking about maybe three or four people in the KGB who know about the tunnel. They they don't uh, inform the KGB station in Berlin about this because. Um, you know, it's it's too close hold. Uh, the Red Army, the, the uh, Marshal Gretschko, who is the uh, commander of the group of Soviet forces in Germany, um, he's told nothing about the tunnel for months and months. Finally, um, they decide that they're starting to get hints that maybe uh, the West is picking up a lot more intelligence than they they realize would be lost through through the tunnel. And in fact, the the um, the, the West is actually managing managing to intercept some KGB conversations too that were um, not the ones that were going directly back to Moscow, but uh, conversations between uh, KGB offices in Germany and um, and uh, also with the GRU. So they're they're getting um, information about uh, Soviet intelligence operations as well as military information. Um, and the uh, the KGB decides it's time to do something about the tunnel, but they want to have uh, some sort of foolproof excuse that will protect the lake. Right. And um, they, um, and this is, uh, they, they bring it to Khrushchev, who is um, taken over uh, along, um, you know, part of uh, the Soviet leadership after Stalin uh, had died in 1953. And, and Khrushchev and Bulganin, who is the premier, um, approve this plan to um, expose the tunnel and they have to wait for um, a big rain in Berlin when um, a big rain comes and creates all these short circuits in the uh, telephone system. You know, all the, the telephone uh, uh, tunnels and, and uh, culverts where the wires are being held begin to flood. And uh, that causes short circuits in the line. Legitimately, there's a lot of short circuits and so crews have to be sent out. And one of these crews happens to discover, you know, they dig right above the, the tunnel and, and find something strange. The crew that was sent there didn't know about the tunnel, but they'd been, you know, you know, there was a reason they'd been sent to this location. So it was being sort of controlled behind the scenes. And they were quite shocked when they found it. I, I, I can imagine. Uh, they were probably pretty proud of themselves at that point. What, this became something of an international incident, right? Surprising folks and so on, right? That this existed. Yeah, yeah the, I mean, the CIA, um, the expectation had been that if the Soviets discovered it, and they knew it would be discovered eventually, they were going to be so embarrassed that they wouldn't say anything about it. But um, the opposite was true. Um, Khrushchev was interested in having some kind of propaganda hammer that he could, you know, bash the Americans over the head with. And he was also trying to kind of uh, create some space, a divide between the British and the Americans and saying, you know, the Americans were the bad, the bad guys and the British, they don't want this cold war that's being foisted upon them by Washington. And um, Khrushchev wants, um, wants to have this, you know, use the tunnel as a way to accuse the, um, the West of, of using Berlin as a uh, nest of spies, you know, instead of being there to protect the freedom of West Berliners, they're only in Berlin because they're using it as, as this espionage base, you know, and, and, you know, shame on them for saying that, you know, the Soviets are the bad guys. You, you are the ones who are, who are, you know, doing this illegal tunnel. And they, so they, they call the press in, um, you know, the day after the tunnel is discovered and they, it's just a big, um, you know, press sensation. They bring reporters down into the tunnel and there's just unbelievable um, sophisticated uh, amplifiers and equipment down below um, the, the highway in, in Berlin where this, uh, this tunnel had been dug to. And, you know, it was just, it was mind boggling. Um, 
for the journalists who were there to, to you know, see this, uh, <laughs> this level of, um, you know, communication sophistication uh, right below the, um, the, the street there in Berlin. So it, it, um, it becomes, they bus in um, diplomats from, from all the different countries and, you know, they open up to tourists and, um, you know, there's a Berlin tunnel tour that goes on for, you know, six or eight months and you know tens of thousands of people visit the the tunnel it becomes one of the biggest draws in uh, berlin in 1956. but uh, the, the the ironic thing was that um it instead of um embarrassing or or bringing shame upon the americans the the general reaction is wow that's pretty good that they pulled a fast one on the kgb and no no one had had thought it possible that the cia which was seen as kind of this bumbling outfit would would be able to pull off something like that and so um you know the, there was just levels of deceit on on multiple <laughs> fronts uh, in this operation well i i want to ask about one more question about blake and then i, I think the third of these stories and uh i i read some of your uh, interviews about this uh also fascinating all the work that you did to get the story that you report on in your book. But talk to us about Blake. At what point does he get found out? And what was his damage to the West, to perhaps British intelligence officers and so forth over the period uh, that he was providing intelligence? Yeah, um, well, well, Blake, um, what happens with Blake is that, um, as often happens with moles or spies, is that they are betrayed by another spy. So in um, in Blake's case, there was a, a, a Polish intelligence officer who began providing intelligence uh, to the West, to the, um, to the Americans about um, information that the KGB was getting from some source, source within British intelligence. So, um, and, and they 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 show um, the the Polish officer uh, shows them documents that very few people would have had access to, and Blake is one of the few people that would have been a, in a position to to get a document like that. So at first the you know MI6 refuses to believe that you know Blake could possibly be a suspect. He's held in very high regard, and nobody you know he's it's just dismissed out of hand that the, the idea that Blake could be a spy, but uh, eventually enough evidence, uh, begins to build that, um, that they, um, they decide to pull Blake back from Lebanon where he was, uh, stationed at the time in Beirut going to, uh, to language training. And, uh, they lure him back to London and begin interrogating him and he confesses. Um, and, um, you know, Blake, uh, was it was this was like a huge scandal in uh, in Great Britain and also uh, for the Americans uh, who were outraged, uh, mad at the British for you know allowing their service to be penetrated like this. And and Blake was given um, what it uh, what was the longest sentence in modern British legal history. He couldn't be executed for his crime, so he, he was given forty two years, which was um, an unprecedented sentence in the British legal system. But um, uh, as I write in the book, five years later, in 1966, he he manages to escape, and that's that's quite a story in itself. And you know, he made his way eventually with accomplices uh, to Berlin, uh, and you know, sort of hidden in, in the uh, the back of a van, and then um, is uh, is flown to Moscow. And you know, he's living there to this day. I, I interviewed him, uh, in fact, for for the book, and uh, he's uh, 97 years old, and He's, yeah, I mean, he, he did enormous damage, um, particularly to British intelligence. Um, he, uh, he gave, the, he gave the, the KGB the names of, of many, many agents who were working um, for British intelligence. You know, these are primarily East Germans who were reporting um, to the British on different aspects of uh, what was going on behind, uh, behind the Iron Curtain. So... Um, you know, some of these people were imprisoned. Um, it, it's quite possible that some might have been executed. The record is is murky on that, um, but uh, there there does seem to be indication that there might have been a, an East German 
colonel who uh, was executed um, and who had been betrayed by Blake. So um, he also gave the KGB an enormous information about um, about British intelligence operations, uh, you know, their methods and um, different operations that were being planned or were, were in place. And he did a lot of damage to the United States as well. So he he was really one of the most damaging spies of the Cold War. But, you know, his his take on it is um, he, he likes to see himself, and he, as he told me, as, a, as kind of a peacekeeper because, um, you know, he, he thinks the tunnel in a way helped to keep the peace. So he says, you know, he thinks that by um, both sides kind of getting a, an eye into what was going on um, and, and seeing that the other side was not planning to attack, you know, his espionage um, was one of the things that kept, uh, you know, people from, from hitting the nuclear button. So uh, he, he says he's neither a, a traitor nor a hero. He just... Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. So tell us just a little bit more and then we'll go to questions. Um, you, in addition to interviewing him, which um, long, long lived as he is, um, and, and you went to considerable lengths to make that connection to him. Who were some of the other people you interviewed? What were some of the other records he had uh, access to? Well, yeah, there was, I was really lucky. Um, you know, this, this operation, essentially, when I was working on this, had, had taken place 60 years earlier. But um, there were still some very key figures um, around who were, who were involved. Um, you know, one was Hugh Montgomery, who was basically Bill Harvey's right-hand man in Berlin uh, for the tunnel. And, you know, he, he was there, um, you know, when the tunnel was discovered and, um, he was the guy dealing with, um, a lot of the, the day-to-day -day stuff, uh, that was going on the, uh, a couple of the, um, U S army Corps of engineers, um, uh, officers, uh, Keith Comstock and, and, um, Bob Williamson, who were both captains and oversaw the, the, the construction. Um, there was, uh, the CIA communications site manager, Eddie Kendall, um, uh, was another great source. Now, on the British side, uh, Peter Montagnon, who was this fascinating figure, he would go on to um, produce um, the the BBC Civilization series with Sir Kenneth Clark. Uh, but he he was a, a, a British intelligence officer who was down there in the tunnel. Uh, he, he worked closely with Blake, ironically. So he knew he was a friend of Blake's. And then he was involved in the, the tunnel operation. And um, I met with him uh, several times in, in France to, you know, talk about his experiences. And um, plus there were uh, just some, some great records. Um, actually, ironically, the Stasi records, you know, the East German Security Service um, records in Berlin, which uh, are, are available now, had interesting information about Blake from, you know, he'd gone there to speak to Stasi officers after he had escaped. And, uh, you know, he, he talked about the tunnel at that point. Um, and the Eisenhower Library in, um, in uh, Kansas and uh, Abilene had some, you know, fascinating records from Dulles as well as Eisenhower uh, oral uh, interviews and um, um, memos and so forth. Fascinating. Um, so, Carrie, uh, do you want to rejoin us? Uh, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? This has been uh, one of the books you've especially enjoyed, I understand. This is really a great book. So if you are interested in this, and if it's a story that you've never heard of, which was the case for me, it's really a good one to pick up and read. Because, of course, in our short time together, we can only cover a small portion of the whole story. So you'll want to check that out. We've got a link in the chat for you. Um, so one question for you is, is the Berlin Wall a direct result of this operation or is there any connection to that in this operation? Um, yes and no. I mean, the, uh, the wall was, was built um, in, in part um, because of concern about espionage um you know the the way that uh the there was uh free access you know from the east to the west and back and forth so it was easy for um agents 
on the East German side to come to the West to meet with um, their uh, case officers. But the real, the real force driving the wall was the, um, the mass of refugees who were, who were trying to, to leave East Germany and indeed uh, all of Eastern Europe uh, via Berlin to get to the West. I mean, they were losing 100,000 plus a year. And um, the, you had uh, uh, Walter Ulbricht, who was the, uh, the leader of East Germany, uh, was, was just going crazy with, uh, you know, the uh, East Germany was essentially bleeding to death, he thought, and he managed to persuade Khrushchev that they needed to put up this, this wall. So, the, I mean, the tunnel and, and the wall are, are certainly connected, but, it, you know, the tunnel, um, you know, didn't lead to the to the wall in any sort of direct sense. It, but the when the wall is constructed, that really ends Berlin's days as the real center of, of espionage uh, during the Cold War. Because once you you don't have that easy access from from east to west, um, you know a lot of the information dried up, and you didn't uh, you know there there was a, the time in the fifties when uh, you know you had. 10,000 plus intelligence operatives working on both sides of, uh, you know, the East and West, but the, the wall put an end to a lot of that. Right. Okay. So uh, real quick, Andrew would like to know if there's an audio book version of Betrayal in Berlin. Yes, there is. In fact, um, there's a, there's a, a U.S. edition and a British audio edition. So depending on what accent you like, um, they they both uh, they both you know I think they both both uh, narrators did a very good job so it's uh, yeah, it's available you know also in um, ebook Kindle formats. Okay, fantastic. And one last question for you: What do you hope that readers will take away from Betrayal in Berlin? You know, there's a a lot of ambiguity uh, in the book. I, I mean, it's it's sort of. Um, you know, lots of times um, we see everything in, in black and white, and you know, we people make judgments on the on the basis of um, you know incomplete information all the time. And you know, with with the tunnel, there were a lot of bad assumptions that were being made on on both sides, um, and things were never quite what they they appeared to be. Um, but you know, it was uh, you know it was a remarkable operation, both. Um, in terms of uh, you know the dedication that you know a lot of people put into this project over a course of years because they were still um, having to to transcribe and analyze this intelligence for for years after the uh, the tunnel was discovered it there was so much that was uh, collected that uh, you know the operation um, you know didn't dry up the, the day that the, uh, the the tunnel was discovered so I, I think um, you know, I, I was just really impressed with uh, uh, the level of de dedication that uh, people on all sides of this uh, project brought to it. Um, so yeah, it's a. I think it, it's a. It's a story that kind of captures a lot of the uh, the murkiness of the Cold War. Okay, thank you. All right, th this has been fascinating, and like I said, there's so much more in the book that we weren't able to touch on tonight, but we did learn some some great. Uh, parts of the story tonight. So thank you so much. Uh, just a reminder, this is our, our last interview for this year. The next two weeks, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, fall on Thursday night. So we will not be doing a broadcast. And then we will be back the first Thursday in January, which is January 7th. And we will be having a conversation with Amity Schles about the Great Society programs of the 1960s. So please join us for that. And Lee, did you have anything you want to wrap up with? I, a, a few different things. One is uh, that we are, Carrie and I are eager to have in-person history camps again. We don't know when that's going to happen, but we're eager for it to happen again. And we're going to ask uh, Steve to join us. And if the stars align and schedule works and so forth, he'll come and talk to us about this or perhaps one of the other very interesting books he's written and uh, if, if it's not, if those don't happen soon, maybe we'll ask uh, Steve back and, and we can do another Thursday night. Uh, this, is, this is great. Um, I, I just want to reiterate a couple of things. Great schedule next uh, next year. Uh, if people aren't familiar with Amy Schley's, she's uh, she's the lady who wrote a really well-received book on 
uh, Coolidge wrote a book on, on the depression called The Great uh, the Forgotten Man. Uh, and, and that'll be another great evening. As Carrie, uh, I think, mentioned, there we go. Uh, you'll find that schedule at uh, historycamp.org slash schedule. I think there's a link on the page if you're looking at, if you're watching us on the History Camp site. Uh, and I just encourage people to, to learn more about the pursuit of history and consider joining us. Uh, this is an effort that Carrie and I have been on for a, a couple of years. I started History Camp some uh, seven and a half, eight years ago. And last year we put together a, a, a nonprofit as a way to try to support these efforts. And really what that means is uh, with the support of folks listening uh, through their membership and donations. So thepursuitofhistory.org. We look forward to seeing you in 2021. Thank you. Good night. Good night.